So, ladies and gentlemen, as I promised you uh, when I introduced uh, this recording, I am now interviewing uh, the daughters of Joseph Beer. I have of Beatrice Beer. Say hello. <laughs> uh, hello. Bonjour. Hello. <laughs> and I have Dr. Suzanne Beer. Hi. Bonjour. <laughs> Thank Paris. you. Thank you so much. For, uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate this uh, for agreeing to be on the show today. Uh, let me start off by telling you how this all started, folks. About a few months ago, actually it's back in May, I attended a concert at the uh, Lincoln Center. Uh, it was Simon Rattle conducting, um, oh, what was the word? It was a model work. I believe it was Leafed on the Edge. Yep. And... Backstage, or we were trying to get in to see Sir Simon, I met Beatrice, and you had this package with you. And yes. you were so desperate to get it to him. And I said, what's going on here? And then, after a while, you didn't get the chance, I'm not sure if you did, but then later you were kind enough to send it to me. And um, it was this recording on CPO of your father's uh, operetta, you got to help me here. I want to call. I call it Polish wedding. That is Perfect. the American translation of it. But how do you pronounce it? Uh, Polnische Hochzeit. You Polnische know, Hochzeit. Polnische Hochzeit. Right. Polnische Hochzeit. Perfect. Yes. And um, it's a really fascinating story. I first of all, I have to commend the both of you for really championing your father's work. Uh, because uh, reading about his life, which is a fascinating life, it's tragic, it's, um, well, well, we'll get into that. But yeah. he wrote this opera, this is really considered to be one of the true last operettas. Okay. Um, it premiered in 1937, if I'm correct. Yes. Uh, he had had a previous success. It was an opera called The Prince von Schiras. Yes. In 1934, which premiered at the Zurich Opera House. And then he wrote this work, which was a smash hit. Unfortunately, um, in the very next year, the Anschluss Correct. took place. Uh, his music was banned by the Nazis. And, uh, he had a very difficult time. Uh, talking about survival, your father was an absolute survival. He f f uh, first fled to France, uh, where I think at one time he was reduced to even, even eating garbage. Uh, and then he made his way to Nice, where he remained there, and he really remained there for the rest of his life. Uh, but not surprisingly, he was in hiding during those war years, uh, didn't compose any music, uh, struggled um, to make a living. And the thing about it, which in a way I admire about him, is that he was really, uh, how, how can I phrase this? He was really adamant. I mean, he would not work with certain people because he felt that they were co uh, Nazi collaborators. He was true to his word. And the fact is that it, the experience he had really, tell me if I'm wrong, but experience he had really affected him, and he didn't really compose much music for the rest of his life. He did, he did compose. No, no. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, Sergio. I, I, uh, is this, do you, um, you know, I know that something of that nature was written in the back the cover of the CD, but it's... Oh, I'm not going by the CD. I'm not going by the back of the CD. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry. So I'm not going by the back of the CD. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, because he did compose, like, uh, never stopped composing until his last breath. Basically, uh -huh. he composed during the war. He composed without a piano, everything in his head. And he even composed a, a ghost opera for somebody to try to, uh, to uh, which was performed at the Zurich Opera House. That was during the war to obtain some funds to send to his parents and to try to uh, free them from Poland and get them, you know, back to safety, but which failed, obviously. And then after the war, he composed every day. That's the way we knew him, like 18 hours a day. Um, and nothing got performed. Nothing got performed. That, that's the part that's right. But he went on composing daily, you know. 
Well, and um, it's like the one opera you wrote, the ghost opera, you're right, he wrote it without a piano. He was a prodigy. Yes, yes, and no, uh, yes, and even uh, like actually, you know, during the war in hiding, he did not even have a piano. He would write everything, you know, uh, hearing all the uh, instruments in his head, and then when it was performed, uh, uh, it was also uh, played on the radio. Like the uh, he heard it on the short wave radio, I think, and he heard that's when the first time he heard it, <laughs> and he said, "Oh, it's pretty good. I would have made a few, you know, corrections here and there, but pretty much I'm happy." <laughs> so yeah, everything is in his head, you know, and like, you know. Few weeks, weeks he'd whip it. Actually, you know what? The Polish Hochzeit was written in three weeks. You know the whole thing. So yeah, he, they call him the prodigy. Well, I, you know, can I just ask you a question? Why? I guess it was too difficult to come to America. Oh, he, he, you are you asking why he didn't come, Sergio? Yes. Yes, I guess he was, you know, maybe he just was in need for uh, composing, you know. I mean, he did have an offer to uh, teach in a major conservatory in New York, but he turned it down. He did not want to teach. You know, he had an offer to write um, a simplified version of his doctorate by Jan Kelevich, who was like the prominent French uh, philosopher, musicologist, and he turned that down. You know, he, he just wanted to compose. That was his only passion, so... But let me ask you, ask the both of you, what is it, what was it like? He was writing all this music, but it wasn't being performed. I would be, if I was in a situation that, I would be incredibly frustrated. Oh, uh, uh, Suzanne, uh, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I didn't think about it, uh, about it being performed. It was so much like reality. It was used, we were used to it, and I was used to listening to him playing, playing it on the piano, and it was beautiful. I was putting my ear against the door because I didn't have the right to listen to it, so I was <laughs> putting my ear, and I was so happy listening to his music. Yes, but, but the, and you said, I think you, you asked if it was frustrating for us or for him, Sergio? For him. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's okay, well, so my, 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 my thought of that, you know, and Suzanne, you can help me, um, you know, he tried uh, off and on, but, go ahead. He was trying all the time to get, to, to get performances, he was traveling uh, regularly to Vienna, to Paris, to Zurich, and was always trying to get performances, I think he was very, very frustrated about it, that's for sure, yes. But he didn't want to have an orchestra which wasn't able. He always, was, always wanted to have a good enough orchestra because he thought his music couldn't be played by non-professional, by students. Like, he had offers of students wanting to play his music, but he discarded it. Mm, yeah. Yeah, you know, because I'm glad you brought that point, because as people heard in the first act, this is extraordinary, beautiful music. Oh, thank you. And, and uh, I'm going to get still to record in just a few seconds. It's extraordinary music, and, you know, it's performed by the Munich Radio Symphony Orchestra. Yes. And, yes, you know, you good. need an orchestra of that caliber yep. to play Absolutely. this music. And, you know, you hear influences that he hears. You hear some jazz. You hear, of course, Viennese opera. I mean, he encompasses, encompasses everything. All these influences that he heard into this work. Yes, yes. You know, actually, this was sort of like a youth work. You know, I think he was trying his style, and that's why I don't think of it as a, you know, typical operetta. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's going to come down in history as an opera or just a great, like you know, Fledermaus or whatever, something that transcends genres. Because he included operetta, but there is also some Sturm und Drang, some Brahms. You know, his favorites. Composers were Brahms, Tchaikovsky, and Beethoven. Uh, and Brahms and Tchaikovsky were born on May 7, too. Sorry. <laughs> like him. And also, um, I have to ask the both of you, yeah. just in terms of background, what... Oh, wait, I, have, I have to talk about... Uh, uh, Suzanne, Dr. Beer is an artist, and Beatrice, of course, yes. is a soprano. I should, I should yes. mention that as well. Um, uh, what was it like living in a house full of music. Oh. See that? Oh, it's, yeah, it was great. It was like, it's, it's like a life, you know. It's like his life, he kept it in the music and we could hear him when he was playing the music and when he wasn't yeah. playing the music, he was a bit like a ghost sometimes. Yes, it was. Music like my life now. 
and it's, it's been like this ever since the beginnings, thanks to him. Yeah. As for, uh, he, yeah. Yeah, you know, he was composing all the time, and like Suzanne said, we were not allowed to, you know, he was very, very focused, so, we, you know, he was in the back of the apartment playing his piano and composing all day, and so once in a while he would allow us, he would call us, my mom and, and my sister and I, to listen to a piece he felt was, you know, ready for us to hear, and I'll never forget those moments, you know, they were like... You know, I was just like in heaven, you know, such beauty he would, and he was a great pianist too, you know, he could have been a concert pianist, but that's also something he turned down, but so uh, just playing on the piano with his melodies, you know, just, I'll never forget. Now, just how did he, recording, this is by the way, as I mentioned earlier folks, on the CPO label, How and the CPO is a label I'm very familiar with, I've played many recordings on CPO on my show, I have many of their recordings, and their specialty is uh, works which are unknown, or rarely played. It's sometimes by well-known composers, but also, but in particular, composers who have been overlooked uh, and uh, unjustly overlooked, such as your father. And but this is really one of the. Uh, this came out earlier this year, I believe. How did this recording come about? Oh my God. <laughs> But to make a long story short, you know, my mother, you know, who was my father post-war, he made her post-war, she was his main inspiration and support system, uh, and his only one after the war, basically. So after he passed, she just went crazy wanting to make sure the music was performed. And so to fast forward, like in 2011, uh, she really insisted we should find a publisher. You know, I started by doing concerts uh, all over Europe uh, and, and the United States of his music to try to rouse interest. And uh, after a while, my mother said, we need to get a publisher here. So we got a fantastic publisher in Vienna. Like, you know, he's a major publisher called Doblinger Music Verlag. And they are helping tremendously. And they're the one who made that connection with CPO and, you know, the Münchner, the Münch, Münchner Rundfunk uh, Orchestra. You know, so we have them to thank for. They're fantastic. And you mentioned, of course, you have mentioned that of course, he was composing all the time, which yeah. means, where is that music? Uh, yeah. Oh, God, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we have two huge, right, Suzanne? We have two huge operas that are still, you know, non-published, coming, you know, among others. Uh, uh, will they be also eventually recorded by CPO? We don't know yet, you know, that's, you know, um, Suzanne, if you want to talk about Stradella, the next project, or you want me to say it, or... Yeah, talk about it. It's good. Oh, yeah, yeah, just, you know, quickly, you know, so Spanish Hansard was composed when he was, like, in, in, in like, three weeks in his, in his mid-twenties. Then came the war. He was in hiding, composed Stradella in Venedig, Stradella in Venice, mostly in hiding during the war, performed at the Zurich Opera House in 49, uh, premiered at the Zurich Opera House in 1949. So that's the next project. It's not official yet, so we can't give details, but there is a big premiere coming up of that opera, which is, like, a grand... You know, Zeffirelli type uh, uh, scope opera. <laughs> oh, that's great! And 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 yeah. let me ask. Let me ask. And, uh, oh know, no, go ahead. Major works that he did after 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 the war, was, which has never been performed. He, he did a new Polish Hochzeit, which is called something like the Ball of the Emperor, or something has many titles. And the very last one, which is called Mitternacht on a Traum, which is Mit. Night Summer Dream, like, and um, it's uh, and he wrote the librettos and the music. Yeah, after so the war, he did the whole thing. Yeah, and yeah, um, it is. oh, I'm sorry because I have to ask. Uh, since he wrote all this music, are there also perhaps a symphony, concertos? What else is it? My father was very much into theater music. He okay. Really loved, loved combination of the two and he was really very much into writing librettos and he has written lots of librettos we have cardboards full of librettos <laughs> and music yes there is one piece of work you know when he was but and was also thinking about how it was going to be exhibited oh, so he had also his special at something visual 
Mm-hmm. He has a staging part. He, he said he was not just an opera composer. He said he was also a stage director. And he actually, he wrote in the Libretti so many stage directions on how it should look. And I'm thinking the stage director is not going to have much to do. Just read what my <laughs> wrote. <laughs> Which I don't know, but I, I must mention that quickly. As far as your question is, great question, because before the war, when he was young, like in school, there's a bunch of lost music which was instrumental, and I think that's when he was still finding him his own style. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah, that's to remain to be found. There is one piece of music that was found at the Universal Edition, you know, which was like Mahler and Beethoven's uh, publisher before. You know, the whole thing. Uh, and so I went there in Vienna and they found a piece called the Triptych, which is, you know, only orchestra. It's called, my father called it a jazz symphony. And that is supposed to be, you know, premiered soon, only, you know, like a 12 minute piece. Okay. And it's completely yeah. instrumental. And apparently, uh, it has been played in Vienna last year. And uh, the person who did the paraphrase, because it's a very complicated piece, said okay. it. I could hear some jazz, of course, influences, but also Scriabin's influence. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my sister went to Vienna for, for a performance of, like, a, a condensed version. And, you know, you know, Sergio, that my father wrote a, a whole doctoral thesis on Scriabin, you know, which is supposed to be, like, sort of like a very hermetic composer, and that's it's going to be published in Paris soon, where, you know, my sister and I are editing it and, make, and making it ready for publishing. Well, you know, it reminds me of a line that Mahler said. Uh, when Mahler said, you know, when his music at, at the time wasn't being performed, and he said, one day my time will come. And you think oh. that's true with oh. Joseph Beer, that finally his time has come. That's beautiful. Thank you. It gives me the Thank chills. You Thank much. you, Sergio. That's beautiful. I didn't know Mahler had problems, too, then. <laughs> oh, great composers always have trouble <laughs> at first, oh, you know. Thank you. You give people. us courage. You know, people, eventually people, you know, if they stray as your father was, you stray true to who you are and your voice and your music. Eventually, people will discover you and come to you. Sometimes it takes longer than it should. That's beautiful. Like but, you're one of those, you're a channel of discovery then, Sergio. Uh, yes, yeah, I've always loved discovering <laughs> composers, I don't know, and new music. And oh. uh, once again, I want to thank the both of you for uh, oh, coming on my show. Thank you. I appreciate That's this so much. so much. Well, thank you for having us, Sergio. This thank you so much. And now we'll go off to Act Two. Okay, okay.